for it. And we're live. Boom. It's official, guys. We are ready to roll. Hopefully, you guys are ready as well because it's time to go all in. Right, Alex? The boys are back in town, man. It's true. We've been gone for a full week. I know. Everyone get excited. We're back. But before we jump into it, as always, make sure you leave a like, comment down below, subscribe. And if you're interested in joining the wholesale program, links down in the description below for that. If you want access to Magic, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Flesh and Blood, and so much more at wholesale prices. And if you got any questions or want to be a part of the community, make sure to check out our Discord link down in the description below. I mean, man, if you're if you're at the blackjack table and you lose like three hands in a row, you go all you in. Double you double down. down. If, it, if the roulette table hits red 10 times, you double down all in on black, right? If it's Pokemon true. does some reprints and restocks, and th- you go all in. You just keep going all in until you win. That's the it's name of the game. just how it is. You know, personally, I have uh, I've been in the business of um, starting to take out personal loans now and nice. just tripling, quadrupling down, you know. Perfect. Uh, that That's what I think is the, the smart play at this point to do. I mean, it's the obvious play, right? Yeah. I mean, the more debt you can get yourself into with cardboard, I think that's just a good life to live by. Good. Yeah. Same. I, I agree. Financial <laughs> advice. <laughs> but yeah financial advice yeah, yeah that's cool it's cool it's cool but for today's topic folks as you guys probably saw it's now or never and i think this can really apply to a couple of things i think the first thing we you know this is important because it was part of uh last week's conversation but astral radiance back in stock pokemon center website obviously we have seen the price of astral radiance it's now 175 so it really is like a conversation of hey if you want to get astral radiance for like msrp prices it's it's kind of now or never because odds of you getting it for cheaper than 144 unless you somehow find it locally sold it's very unlikely so if you're going to want to kind of hop in now is kind of one of the times to do it But I think an even more important conversation that I feel like we need to have, even though that is of relevancy, is 151. I mean, we know that 151 for Japanese product obviously just got a reprint. It's, I mean, at least in our wholesale program with our Japanese suppliers, we're selling it right now for 85 bucks a box. So, and, you know, I think Alex, you were saying uh, before the stream, you're thinking it's going to go sub 80. So at the end of the day, like, I'm a firm believer that 151 having gone above $200 a box, it now being as cheap as it is, it just feels like one of those ones where you have to just like, it's just free. It's free tendies in my mind. It's kind of like when Lost Origin and Silver Tempest got reprinted. I kind of see 151 in the same limelight. Uh, I'm not as bullish on it. Like I'm yes and no. Like I don't think it's going to recover as fast as Lost Origin and Silver Temp or Lost Origin did at least. Like, I think Japanese is going through like a bit of a bubble burst, and then also on top of that, 151 got reprinted. Like, I don't think it's a normal reprint. Like, the whole Japanese market's crashing. 151's getting a reprint as well. 151, I believe in long term, but like, I, I just hope everyone has a good long term mindset. Like, just remember, this could it could be another two three years before it hits 200 dollars a box again, longer or shorter. But I I, I don't think it's like a a for sure short-term play like oh you buy 85 and it's gonna be 200 next year I- i'd be careful with that that's it well i mean i guess how i look at it from that perspective is like the in the same regards of lost origin right lost origins high before it got reprinted was 200 dollars. obviously it's getting pretty close at like 177 right now but in my mind like hey even if you went in you bought lost origin for 110 and it goes up to 150 like you're happy so for me, I see it in the same regard of 151. I'm not saying, oh my God, 200 bucks, end of year. But if you go in and you buy it, let's say it drops down to like 70 bucks and then it goes up to 100, like that's a 40% return right there. I'm stoked, even if it's so far off from its all, 50% off from its all time high, um, if you know, or 100%, depending on how you look at it. So for me, it's less of like a, Oh, you know, do I think that we're going to see its all time high as soon as possible? I think it, it's going to have a strong like bounce in my mind where it's going to eventually find its floor. It's going to then correct in price after the supply comes and gets eaten up. The question ultimately is, when is that going to happen? And if you're one person that maybe, for example, you're more nervous about the price correcting, you can always wait. And then once the price has kind of found its floor, you can always wait for the price to rise slightly and get in then just so that you know you feel more comfortable with not catching a falling knife. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I agree with all that. I mean, I think the key word is patience, right? I think people be patient moving into this. Um, if you want a dollar, if you want to buy some at 85, dollar cost average, if it goes down, like just be patient on the way down. Don't be like, I wouldn't be going all in at the first, you know, price drop you see. Um, so I would just have patience moving into it and then have patience holding it. Like goes both ways. So that's, that's kind of my big word with when it comes to 151, this reprint, just patience. So what is your general thoughts on kind of how people should be playing astral? Um, man, I, I'll be honest. I didn't see it coming back in stock. Um, coming back in, I, st I still like Astro. A lot of people are down on it. I mean, in, in all reality, like, I think it's as strong as like a Silver Tempest. I mean, sure, you can say it's got Lugia. It's got the Rayquaza, you know, Altar. But like Astral, you got the Machamp. You got the Palkia, the Dialga. You've got the Star Me V. You've got the Legendary Bird Trainer Galleries. Like, it's a pretty decent set. I know a lot of people are down on it. It's nowhere near like a top set. But I mean, it's a good middle of the road set. Um, I don't see the market like uh, tanking because it's back on Pokemon Center. You have to remember, Pokemon Center is still a niche website. I know it's the main Pokemon website, but a large majority of people who buy in this hobby, they're TCG player, eBay type stuff. They're not, they don't shop on Pokemon Center. So I don't see it like crashing the market. I, I, I don't think there's enough uh, margin there to buy on Pokemon Center, pay the, pay the fee or uh, taxes and then flip it. So I think it'll probably stay around where it's at, like the 170 range. But um, yeah, it's definitely going to stunt its growth for the, you know, the short term. I, I, yeah. As far as being a pickup, I mean, if you, if you have already picked up your lost origin, right. Then you've already picked up your brilliant stars. I think Astral's right after those two. If you don't have any of it, I'm still more of a fan of like a lost origin and a brilliant stars on Pokemon center than Astral, but yeah, it's still a good price. Uh, shout out to Pokemon department store. Thank you so much for the $5. He said, looking for pokey influencers to rep the brands. Nomics. I think he's talking to you, Mr. Sponsorship. Hey man, let's give, let's give him a shout out. Like he, he does, he shares some cool stuff. Mm -hmm. He like has custom binders, custom, like, you know, all kind of custom Pokemon stuff. He can print your logos, your names, like in your favorite Pokemon, like anything you want. They, they look, they look pretty awesome. So yeah, I mean, definitely reach out to the Pokemon department store. If you need anything like custom designed, he he's been, it. he's been with us forever. I think he was one of my first thousand subs. He created uh i follow him on instagram i remember when i first he did he did like pokemon coasters where he created certain color coasters and he could have a pokemon card that you have which were really cool but i really liked his moo moo milk packages which i thought were really cool i don't know if you ever saw those but they were yeah, like moo milk cool. i think they were candles i'm not 100 percent certain but he's had a lot of really cool designs so yeah definitely shout out to uh shout out to poco department store but let's take a second there to to Realize Eli's little <laughs> nudge to me there. Call me Mr. Sponsorship. Oh, what is that? <laughs> Mr. Sponsorship. Just throwing baby. that little shade at me. <laughs> you know? Hey, Always man, have to make a living in this business, all right? You know, I feel that. I feel that. But yeah, no. Um, <laughs> I think that for me, when it comes to Astro Radiance, right? It's selling currently right now. I think I said 175 was the last time I saw is how much Astral Radiance was selling for. Um, I literally just checked two seconds ago. Yep, 175. So if you just do the math and say to yourself, all right, you're selling it 175 after fees, you're, you know, 87 87% uh, of the total value. So 152. And let's say it costs like eight bucks to ship it. You're at a break even point. So if you are buying Astral Radiance right now after fees, you're not losing anything. So it's 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 one of those pickups where unless the price all of a sudden just heavily tanks, which I doubt it because of the Pokemon Center restock. I mean, if that were the case, why is Brilliant still where it is? Why is Lost Origin still where it is? You know, um, you yeah, just kind of look at it as another thing. opportunity. Yeah, that's one of the biggest negatives of like investing in, in this stuff is the immediate, you know, um, entry point where you're, you know, technically uh, quote unquote down if you were to sell right away because of the shipping and fees. And so, yeah, if you can get in a, in a investment with already being even after shipping and fees, that's a huge leg up when you get into something. Yeah. No, 1000%. I guess now that you ultimately ask yourself the question, right? Cause I mean, you touched on this briefly already, but it's like, okay, it's back in stock. That's fantastic it's an opportunity for you to get in for cheaper. Now, this is kind of your last chance, presumably for 140, uh, 144. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, $144 <laughs> price point for astral, but ultimately 
is that something where after you have the box as part of your collection, are you really more interested in picking that up at 144 to flip than you are Lost Origin? Like Lost Origin is no, already Lost at the Origin same flip. price. The Lost Origin flip is real. Mm -hmm. Uh the cases were selling between like eleven fifty to twelve hundred. So like you know, picking it up for around, I don't know, 900 ish after taxes on Pokemon Center, you can immediately flip it on eBay for like 1150, 1200. The, the flip even made more sense with Lost Origin. Is it still selling pretty hot for that? I know we talked about it on last stream and I was looking at the recently sold. How much has that changed in the past week? I'd have to look at it. I, I believe it's still pretty mm -hmm. close. Mm -hmm. It is a good question, mm -hmm. though. Let's go see what we got going on. Uh, Northwoods Astral did have a tiny booster box reprint. So back in May of last year, both Astral and Brilliant had a tiny reprint. So it wasn't big, but I mean, All right, it April, made a difference. April 14th, 11.75, one just sold. Okay, so 11.75, okay. Two days, ago. two days ago. So I mean, it's selling, it just takes a day or two, it looks like. You know, but I mean, you're still, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, how much is that after fees? Because what's the fee is structuring for items over a, a thousand dollars on TCG or on uh, eBay? Is I'm it like sure. ten is it, is is it percent? Like uh, I'm not sure if a thousand is a threshold or not. Let's just take it, even if it's the full thirteen point two five percent. I mean, eleven seventy five, thirteen point two five. I mean, even with shipping added in, say it's twenty dollars. That's a thousand twenty two bucks. It's, it's easy hundred dollar up right there. That's one hundred and seventy dollars a box and you're paying and then you add shipping into it yeah you're making 160 169 168 roughly i mean that's fantastic for a 900 dollar investment i mean that's that's a that's a great flip yeah that's a phenomenal pickup i mean even if you're yeah i i mean if you're saying to yourself right now let's say you can sell it by the case for 168 you're buying it for we'll say after taxes 140 i mean what 140 150 150 all right we'll say 150 i mean that's per box you're making 18 bucks which multiply that by six that's 100 bucks you're making off of a quick flip so i mean that's solid man that's that's solid just to be able to literally flip this and arbitrage it from pokemon center to ebay so and i feel like it's one of those like obviously not financial advice but it's one of those safer flips because even if hypothetically like it slowly starts to become harder to sell it on eBay because more people start to take advantage of that. It's an item that's going to go up and it's going to go up strong. So it's not one where you're like, all right, I'm trying to, you know, sell this as quick as possible before price is correct. Like, no, this is an item that you can take your time on knowing that it's going to go up in value over time. And especially knowing that once Pokemon center website goes out of stock, that, you're probably going to see some form of a correlation in price adjustment. Hey, hey, let's. Uh, I want. I want to get your opinion on this. So Jimbo Slice asked it, but he he asked me and Pokemon Plumber on when I, he was on my live mm -hmm. on like our kind of tier ranking for English 151. If you were to invest in it, so you're you talking know, about this question right here. Yeah, like so. My my opinion is like, uh, and here's the thing: like the prices are all like over the place now. But like when I was getting UPCs, they were obviously like low 80. So I, I was always like UPCs. ETBs or sorry, UPCs, PC ETBs, ETBs, and then uh, bundles. But a lot of people like the bundles. It's just, I, I think if it, if the bundles get to a point where they don't have a good per pack price, they don't make sense because I don't think there's like a good sealed premium for a bundle the way there will be for like a UPC or, or a PC ETB because they actually have the promos involved. What's your opinion on that? Um. Well, so man it's such a hard one because the bundles are I, I don't i don't really get it like i don't really get the bundles like I why are they so I, I i hate them i don't understand why they're so expensive it doesn't really make sense to me but they are right but they are expensive i guess the only real argument you can make is that a lot of people can't afford uh upc right because they're going for 120 and so maybe people just want, hey, I want to just get a couple packs and this is the cheapest way to do it, which ironically results in them being the most expensive items because the margins are so high. So it's it's hard for me to really understand why. Um, obviously, if you can get the bundles for <laughs> below marketplace, then sure, that's fantastic. But odds are you're going to struggle to do so because of the demand for them. So um, I think this might be a little bit of a hot take. 
Um, but uh, I think I like PC ETBs number one. Um, I th- I just think right now, time and time again, we've seen just specialty sets with specialty ETBs on Pokemon Center perform so strong, like Crown Zenith, One Fifty One, um, Celebrations, um, even even um, Shining Fates right now. Or uh, sorry, not Shining Fates, Paldean Fates. Man, it's always so many different Fates sets. Um, obviously, I think it's still available in stock right now, but I mean. It's one that's, I would argue, the weakest of the ones that I mentioned, which makes sense. So for a set like 151 that has been performing extremely strong, that's kind of when you want to take advantage. I was super duper high on Crown Zenith ETBs when they were being pre-sold. And I remember watching the price go from $65 all the way up to $130 after the release. So it's something that I think... I am is really a good opportunity if you're a firm believer in a strong specialty set to come out. Um, then I would say next up, I would probably go uh, UPCs. Then I would go ETB. Then I would go. Um, then I would go booster bundle. That's kind of my ordering of it all. And the only way, like I would go booster bundles, is if the per pack price was just so much lower than the others. Because otherwise, like guys, I mean, here's the thing. Y- yeah, markets can always be disrupted by new products. However. Other than PC ETBs and booster boxes, we haven't seen sealed item premiums much in other products. The only time products rise is because either the packs inside rise or the promo cards inside the box, tin, whatever it may be, rise. Like we don't see people overpaying for other items because of the sealed nature, the way we do with booster boxes. And so I just wouldn't expect, let's say like 151, you know, it doesn't have a booster box, but like something else, like the only reason the UPC I feel is more because it has promo cards where those can actually affect the price as well as the packs. Whereas the booster bundles, they just have the packs. And so if like, if the per pack price is the exact same as the UPC, I'm going with the UPC. It's got more legs. It's got more, there's more reason to get into it. What did you put as your ranking? Like um, first doors? I can't remember. It was either PC ETB or UPC top. And then it was that that one second, and then it was ETB and booster bundle last. Like I'm just not a fan of booster. Oh, bundle. so we we literally have the same ranking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah. I think um I think for me, uh, booster bundles obviously hold a strong premium right now. And like I said before, if you can get it under market, then fantastic. But for me, I don't see it as like uh, oh, get it under market so you can hold it long term. I'm like, hey, flip it. It's like in the wholesale program, if you can get access to the booster bundles and you by chance are able to, you know, get the allocations because they're so high demand, then then take advantage of that and sell it. But at the end of the day, it's not something I'm holding on to long term. I, I believe more in the hold for the PC ETBs as well as the UPCs. Um, obviously, I'm a fan of the ETBs just traditionally long term, but I feel like they're more prone to reprints, typically speaking. Like if you see any of the reprints that have happened with any of the specialty sets, over the past five years, it's all come down to them just reprinting the ETBs. It's very rare that they print something kind of outside of that. I can't really think of an example where they did that because like with Hidden Fates, I guess you had the Hidden Fate tin reprint, but that was like kind of out of nowhere, but it was followed up by the ETB reprint and then Shining Fates obviously has had many, many ETB reprints. Crown Zenith had ETB reprints. 151's had another wave of ETBs and UPCs. So it's like the ETBs are going to be the number one target, I think, for the Pokemon company. So you're going to be a lot safer, I feel like, going with the PC ETBs because it's not it's not as volatile in the same way. Yeah, if we're talking like a regular set, guys, it's it's, it's just booster box all day. I mean, it's not even a question. Like bundles and booster boxes shouldn't even be in the conversation together. It's obvious. <laughs> um, is there any other questions you wanted to kind of answer, or did you just want to touch on that one? Cause it was oh, I just want to touch on that because we were talking about 151 Japanese. I just figured it kind of flowed. Oh yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see what's gonna happen with 151 English. Um, have you been seeing a lot of the conspiracies that have been going around with Japanese gap for set releases? No, what's going on? Well, there's supposedly a gap. I'll have to go and try and see where within um, the set releases, but there was like 
every single month there's like a new Japanese set that's more or less coming out or every other month. And then there was like one that had like a two or three month gap and people were like theorizing like, oh, this is the reprint. This is this is the reason why this is happening. And people are now trying to hope or kind of theorize that that's going to happen with English and something's going to happen with us. And that's going to translate over to some form of a reprint one way or another, which I mean, at the end of the day, like I guess going into the fall time, as we've talked many times before, like holiday times, Pokemon loves to do reprints, but it's kind of interesting that a lot of people were theorizing that. Do you think, do you think there's going to be a, a, any Scarlet Violet era sets that may not see a reprint? Um, yeah, base set. Yeah. Base set's already gotten a reprint. Basically got a massive reprint. That's what obviously led to Lost Orge and Silver Tempest. I think I think I think base set's one of those ones where it's definitely the best base set. I mean, just because the art designs. I mean, but it's a base set still, right? And ultimately, at the end of the day, you look at it and you say, wow, it's super duper cheap because people are like, it's a base set. But at the end of the day, it's got cool art designs, and it's one of those items where it already got the print because of the lost origins and silver tempest reprints so the odds of it getting another reprint are really really low and i could see it following kind of like what happened with sword and shield base where they kind of just didn't reprint it again obviously covid played a factor into that but i uh, that doesn't change my mindset on it could follow that kind of same trend if hypothetically speaking it doesn't get another reprint which i feel is pretty unlikely honestly there's not really an incentive for them to reprint it no, I, that's that's the only one I've been thinking too. Might not get one. And and here's the thing: it's just like you really have to just decide like what you're trying to do. Like if you're trying to be a business, be a business. If you're trying to flip a uh, product or flip cards, flip cards. But if like you're, if you're trying to be an investor and you're trying to let your money work for you, you have to be realistic with this stuff. Like, yeah, it doesn't matter if there's a set that comes out that becomes an evolving skies and four or five six six seven X's on you. Yeah, that'd be great. But at the end of the day, I've always talked about it. You know, if your 401k were to double every six years, that's usually like at or above average. You're happy. You are a hundred. You're, you're ecstatic about that. If base set even gets to 160, 170, 180 a box in the next three, four years, I'm happy. I'm beating traditional investing. I'm good. Like I don't need every single thing to hit, you know, astronomical levels. Like that's what you should really be chasing is limited downside risk and better gains than you could put make on your money somewhere else. Like, so I'm still, I mean, even if base that doesn't become a three, four, five hundred dollar box, I'm still uh, bullish on it for where at what I, you know, I'm just expecting out of it. Okay, so I, I see, I see actually where, um, I see the, the theorizing now. I went and found the thread. So people are saying that there is about a ten week gap between the next upcoming set release after Twilight Masquerade. So Twilight comes out May 24th, and the next set after that is going to be Scarlet and Violet 6.5, which is going to be August 2nd. So people are saying that, I mean, this is obviously a, a theory, um, but in terms of the overall gap between it, do we think that they're giving themselves some time to do some potential reprints of several sets? You know, Lost Origin, Silver Tempest, and other sets are still in rotation, and so what are the odds that we potentially see some more Sword and Shield Air reprints or if we get a reprint of like Paldea Evolved or something along the lines of that during that time, which for me, like, I don't know, it feels weird to say that because I guess if those reprints are going to happen, it's usually holiday season. And if it isn't holiday season, the only other time I've seen it has been May. I mean, because like I said before, the last... But but the thing is, is like when it's holiday season, it's massive reprints. When it's not holiday season, it's usually one or two things. So like last year, obviously, it was Astral Radiance and Brilliant Stars got a tiny reprint. Year before that, it was a um, reprint for Vivid Voltage and Darkness Ablaze ETBs as well as Shining Fates ETBs. But there was no booster box reprint that came with that. So it's like, okay, it's definitely possible that that could happen. It's around that kind of time frame. But also at the same exact time, if you look at the gaps we've had between the last two or three sets, they've all been, I mean, I don't I, I don't know. Like they've I mean, all been really my, my close. Prediction, to... My prediction is it's going to be probably 151 ETBs and bundles and then probably Paldea Evolved. <sighs> Paldea Evolved. They're gonna have to. I mean, it's 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 obviously the most popular booster box set so far. Yeah, and it's already moving up in like the. I mean, we're seeing cases sell pretty regularly now. Like every 
every couple of days for about $650 on TCG player. Like it's starting to get up in the hundreds now. Um, if it gets to like the 120, 130, 140 range, I could see Pokemon reprinting it. It just makes sense for them. They need yeah. something. Someone in my Discord said the same thing. It's like they need something to reprint. I mean, I just think Paldea Evolved and 151 are just the obvious choices. Yeah. Oh, it's always a fun topic of conversation because yeah. I, I mean, it, it's kind of like the same conversation we were having with Evolving Skies, Fusion, Chilling, right? Are, oh, they're in rotation. There's still a chance they're going to get reprinted. Pokemon did nothing. Pokemon did nothing. They had the tiny Evolving Skies reprint and then said, nope, nothing more. Now, maybe we can say it's different because it was right during the transitioning period of the Silver Borders. But even then, that's a, I feel like such a weak argument at this point just because that didn't stop them from an LO Silver Tempest reprint. You know, like it just feels at this point like the LO reprint, Silver Tempest reprint, the Astral, the Brilliant reprint was a, hey, here we go. Everyone wants some Sword and Shield. We'll give you the most recent ones. And that's kind of it. We're moving on to Scarlet and Violet. Like, I, I hate to say it because trust me, I would love it. But I, I just don't I just don't see it happening. I do think if we're going to get reprints, it's going to be more Scarlet and Violet. Why, why would you love that? That's so awful. Stop, stop wishing harm on us. <laughs> stop wishing harm on my investments. All right, man. So let's let's I think it's time. Let's switch the discussion to something I've been wanting to talk about. Oh man, I already know what this is. The eBay vault moving to PSA. Oh man, you have no idea. Like, I, it's, look, a part of me it does feel bad for the people who had businesses like surrounding it, or people who were making more money off it, those types of things. But man, I am going to be so happy to stop hearing about it. I had so many people like, "You're so stupid investing in sealed. I can just send my slabs to the eBay vault, pay zero percent fees, blah blah blah." All right, well, now that's said and done, it's over. Now, look, you're paying fees again. Everything's back on a level playing field. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as someone who heard the news about it, uh, I think it was like, I well, I heard the news when it first came out. It was one of those things for me where I was like, huh, this doesn't affect me, but I can see some people will be both happy and angry about this. So I... Uh, I mean, it's it's the just continued evolution of companies either buying each other out or partnering with each other. It's it's kind of just the way it is within the hobby. I mean, it's, it's kind of like when the T world, right? It's yeah, it's kind of like when works. TCG Player got bought out by eBay. Like everyone was like, "Oh my god, what's going to happen?" Like <laughs> so far, so, nothing. But obviously, this is that next transition with PSA. And obviously, people are going to get upset because you know the eBay vault <laughs> prices are. Uh, I mean, I have the numbers here. So under a hundred dollars is sixteen percent, which you couldn't even send those to eBay Vault, so it's kind of meaningless. Um, one hundred to four ninety nine though, fourteen percent, and then five hundred to nine ninety nine, thirteen percent, which is probably where a lot of those vault items uh, fell. Which is basically now the same exact cost as selling yourself on eBay. Um, I guess you could say you're saving some shipping fees from PSA, but let's be honest, if you're sending large orders, those shipping fees are like a dollar a card. It's not really even worth it. You probably should just get them back. If you get up to like the 1,000 to 2,400, 2,499, it's 10%, 2,500 to 5,000 is 9%, anything over 5,000 is 7%. Um, but eBay's already got structures in place. Yeah, eBay's got structures in place to where it, it lowers your fees as the price goes up too. In other consignment services you can send to uh, that sell your cards for, you have that same structure. So honestly, I think this is going to lower the amount of people using these vault services. I don't think there's much reason for it. Um, and, and the reason I've always been against it is like I'm not like super against it. I'm happy people are making money. I'm happy people made businesses off it. I, I don't really care that much. I, I more cared about the people who like they can't help to like brag about it or shove it in your face and just it's all they talk about is I I have all these slabs in the vault, I'm not paying fees. Ha ha. It's like okay, now it's over. But um, I, I'm more like thinking like, well, these are collectibles. Like the whole point of of having these over a stock is. You get to like have them physically in person. You get to display them. You get to stack them up at home. You get to see your piles grow. Like the physical nature of it's what makes this awesome. It's like if everything's sitting in a vault, it makes it almost like a stock where you're just like it's like numbers on a screen. And I don't know. That's why I've never been a fan of vaults. But uh, yeah, I mean, now that PSA took over, now that these are going to be the new fees, I just don't think it's going to be that utilized because the fees are basically what it's going to cost selling it yourself, honestly. <sighs> 
Yeah, it's... Oh, man. Come on, Eli. Whew. Hold on. Sorry. I'm trying not to sneeze. I'm getting absolutely crapped on, like, with allergies right now, bro. It's so bad. I haven't been able to breathe through my nose in, like, three days. Okay, I think I'm good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely one of those features which it's it's for those people that are like hey i just want to flip this immediately and sell it on ebay like that's just kind of it right which if you're okay with eating the fees on that because it's within your margin then great but for a lot of people obviously like you just said they're not here to just buy the card flip it a lot of them are really here to just get the card add it to their collection and be able to display it and appreciate the artwork so I, I mean, I see this as net neutral. Like, obviously, it's it, and maybe that's because it doesn't affect me. Maybe if it was something that I utilized more, but I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm I kind mean, of. It, it stabilizes the market, in my opinion. Like, you know, because you had the the amount of the people that were using the vault, they were able to undercut the people that weren't using the vault, and now it just kind of puts everything back on like a right, the same playing field. It's going to regulate the market. Everyone's going to be competing at the same price points and all those cards again. And I mean, it's it's just it's the same rules for everyone. Like, I don't think it's going to be a huge deal. It's just going to raise the price of some cards. Big deal. Like they're already $250 plus cards. In my, in my opinion, if you're buying $250 plus cards, um, I don't think another, you know, 10% is going to break the bank because you're already spending a lot of money in this hobby. <laughs> so that's where I'm at with it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that'll be the next question is what the evolution of prices are going to look like. I mean, you were obviously talking with me about, how um the giratina has gone up so much in value over the last couple of months so you know <laughs> we'll we'll kind of see how that might reflect some of the other alternate art cards yeah and like you know your average player he's he's beating me up in the comments and and yeah anyone who had like a business surrounding it or who's like, who's like a full-time flipper not even full-time but like use the vault a lot they're going to be upset about it they're going to be upset at my takes and that's fine like I, i'm not hating on them like I, you know i'm i'm sorry like it it went away but you know it it was it was pretty obvious that wasn't going to last. You can't have a 0% fee forever. Now I know people thought it was going to turn into a buyer's premium. That was eBay's plan. It was going to be more like a, a PWCC marketplace, but uh, you know, it didn't happen. And now, now it's this, and now you just kind of have to go with the flow and get comfortable with being uncomfortable in this hobby because things are constantly changing. Well, I mean, fees have always been there. So it's kind of like, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it would be abnormal to not have the fee structure. <laughs> Which, you know, everyone can always argue maybe it should be cheaper, but I mean, that's not how it works. They're always going to overcharge. Yeah. It is what it is. Hey, man, it's like the market's going to go on. Everything's going to go on just like normal. I, I don't think it's going to be like a... Here's the thing. I don't... I'd love to know how many people actually utilize the vault, you know, because I know it seems like a lot of people, but again the people that utilize it were usually in the same communities already. So it seems like everyone's doing it, but it's like in reality, I think it was probably still a small portion of the overall hobby and the overall buyers. Cause what we have to remember is the majority of people in this hobby are collectors. They're not sellers. And the majority of like, even a lot of the sellers weren't using it. Right. And so like, I think, uh, I don't think it's going to have a huge effect. I think it's going to be business as usual. You know, people are going to pay a little more. You're going to pay some fees, move on. Yeah, no, 1000%. But like I said, this is one of those topics for me where I'm like, like I, I knew it was going on, but I never utilized it. So for me, I was like, huh, some people are going to be happy. Some people are going to be sad. But for me, I'm not exactly uh, vested in it. So it is what it is. It's kind of the evolution that was anticipated when it came to this. So maybe if I was into like, you know, grading and flipping more commonly i would have a more strong opinion on this topic but i don't know it's kind of it's kind of tough for me to look at it in that regard plus for for me as well if i did sell cards on ebay most of the time it was just the ones that were like just quick money like kind of quick flips because otherwise you could usually sell slabs through like consignment companies outside of this or like general like advertising marketplaces on instagram and other sites just was always easier to go that route. I, you know, I'll address average player, like, because, hey, man, I'm not, I'm not trying to hate on you, your business, man. Um, sorry if it came off salty. Well, here's the thing: I, I'm not salty about the fact the vault, vault was there and people were, were doing well off it. What what I was more talking about is, I mean, especially I saw it in the Discord. I saw it like other Discords. Like, it's it, it's it's this way with a lot of things in the hobby. 
I, I saw people always like giving people a hard time for not using the vault, like, you know, feeling superior because they were vault users. Like if, if it was to the point where if anyone was listing cards for over $250 on their, on their regular eBay store or something, they would get like attacked for it. Like, wh why would you do that? That's so stupid. Send it to the vault. You're paying fees. You shouldn't be doing that. Why are you selling a thousand dollar card? You're going to pay X amount of fees. Send it to the vault. That's so stupid. It's like, I just got so sick of hearing that. It's like, and I'm, I, that, that's the part of it. I'm, I'm glad that's over. Not the fact that you're going to make less money or have to pay fees. I, I'm, I, I'm not salty. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Like it's hurt. It's going to affect your business and things. I was just sick of the people who were like, overly uh overly about it you know and like kind of like shun people for not using it type thing um well honestly we're at about 40 minutes in right now i think is a good time to start um answering questions for those of you guys that are obviously interested in asking us questions make sure to leave it down in the live chat as far as it goes also make sure to leave a like comment down below subscribe really helps the algorithm um Here's, I guess, uh, oh, actually, I, I should also mention as well, if you're interested in the wholesale program as well, get access to Magic Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! Flesh and Blood at wholesale prices. Links down in the description below for that. If you got questions or want to be a part of the community, check out the Discord. Um, but here's a question someone asked you I thought was interesting. How many cards do you sub to PSA on a monthly basis? On average, what percentage do you keep versus sell? So I'm not I'm not a big uh, seller, you guys know. I mean, um, the content side is like probably just as big as my selling side. Um, I usually anywhere from like 50 to hundred cards, depending on the month, like 50 to hundred cards is what I try to submit out of those. Um, not many, man, like under 10, like maybe like anywhere from three to eight a month, we'll say I'll actually keep out of that. So that's kind of like a good range. Dude, I'm just excited to have the storefront, man, and be able to have that like consistent group of individuals coming with their collections and being able to see the cards physically that's going to be such a cool feeling eli's going to be he's going to be a grading grading beast oh i'm going to go so crazy with grading when we get the storefront i'm going to go wild that's that's the thing i'm the most excited about because for me i'm a huge diamond pearl fan and obviously like you're going to want to buy cards to grade in person but man i i'm more looking at some of the like old collections people are going to bring in and being like yeah i got my old diamond and pearl you know seal product or you know level x cards or whatever and i'm just gonna i'm just gonna add that to my own collection that's what i'm really excited about being able to find those cards that are usually hard to find in good condition yeah um so i mean but like it's it's i mean it's it's it, well, it's the benefit that you get for taking on that risk and putting forth that capital and, and doing everything you're doing right now to open a store it's like that's kind of the benefit of what you get for all that work you put in yeah that's for sure <laughs> that's one of them hopefully <laughs> um here's a question from bob do you guys believe in any non-booster box etv upc plays that doesn't leave us for a lot of plays <laughs> non like like sets with non booster boxes yeah Item, items up. no he means items so like oh. do you believe if it's not a booster box an etb or a upc so like a v yeah. box or yeah. like a booster bundle or like a tin or collector's chest yeah so i like um three pack blisters uh three pack blisters especially when they have promo cards that you could see performing well i mean i know one that's popping off recently has been the fusion strike uh three pack blister with the uh the espion promo that espion promo is now worth i mean it was worth like nine to eleven dollars on tcg player and you could still buy the, the three pack blisters with three fusion strike packs for like 12.99 on pokemon center um and there's a lot of three pack blisters if you look if you just type in three pack blister on tcg player and just scroll through you'll see how well a lot of those have uh performed because of the promo card inside and so i like those um and yeah same thing with tins and collection boxes it's all going to be based off the promo card for me like um, how, how well I see those promos doing because, you know, obviously the packs will go up and carry the item, but you're going to be better off with the booster boxes, like carrying the, the packs up. Um, so it's really going to be like a, a promo card play for me. What about um, you? Honestly, uh, it's hard not to kind of agree with it, with what you're saying. I'm like trying to think like, can I say something different? But not really like, like blisters has been something that I remember having a conversation about with a lot of sun and moon era product and how there was multiple 
like price discrepancies between the singles for the packs and the three pack blisters, which also came with the promo. So uh, it's hard because there's been so many good plays around it, but um, I'm actually getting a business call. I'm going to have you answer this next question. Cool. Hey guys, I have a distribution agreement. So I have to take a certain amount of all releases. Would I be wrong to take a small loss on sites like Scarlet Violet base to free capital for other stuff? Oh man, that's going to be more of an Eli question running a full-time business. Like I know, I know all these guys, I mean, a, a lot of the big stores, right? They all have certain products that they sell either at losses or break even just to churn and burn them so that they can, you know, free up money for other things, or they can build up their allocation. So when the good things do come like one English 151, they get as much of that product as possible. And that's where they really make their profits. So and they can really kind of make up for the products they don't make a lot on. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you either take losses or, you know, Instagram, Discord groups like Facebook where you could uh, sell like friends and family um, and you could actually sell at or under market. You could sell under market and not pay fees and really come out ahead still depending on what you're getting it for and your distribution prices. But yeah, it's kind of like a, a problem with all retail businesses. Like it, even, even like the largest companies like, you know, Costco or something, they'll have items that they sell at a break even or a loss just to draw you in because they know when you get there on average, people are going to buy all the other things they have that are at high margins and they're going to make money off of those. So, uh, yeah, man, it's just kind of, that's kind of how it is in retail. You know, got to take the goods with the bads. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> it was, uh, it was about the store. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that, well, within the situation that you're in, First and foremost, um, you obviously in this situation are saying it's an agreement. So you have to take a certain amount of product. I hate to say this, but <laughs> you technically don't have to take it. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but there is always an option for you to not have to take the product, but it does hurt your relationship. That's one thing you always want to consider because the amount of times where You've had absolutely terrible sets where most people have just dropped. I mean, magic is a perfect example when they came out with commander masters. Like that was something where you literally were seeing product values at like 30% below wholesale. So you were losing 30% by just picking up the item and everyone was dropping it and no one was getting affected by it. But depending upon the product, you're obviously looking to drop it's obviously something that could kind of change the way in which your relationship is had with your distributor. I remember I was talking actually to RNG games about this shout out to him because he was saying that he literally told his distributor, Hey, everyone's dropping their commander masters product. You better not forget me because I'm actually picking it up. And, and that's something where you have to kind of treat it in that regard of how do you want to set your relationship up with your distributors? If it's a high demand or if it's not, I shouldn't say a high demand, but if it's just like a middle of the road product that not everyone's dropping, you're just dropping it because you overextend your capital. It's going to make you look bad. But if it's an item that obviously, you know, everyone's dropping, it's not going to make you look bad. But if you go pick it up, and you say, hey, I'm not going to like drop my allocations that you guys gave me, then obviously that's going to kind of put you in a position where, okay, this guy is not like everyone else. He's dropping items. You have to always be conscious of that relationship that you're fostering and garnering with your distributor because that's ultimately uh, the business relationship that you're trying to create when getting access to higher allocations, higher demand product. Because right now we're in a time where, yeah, sure, there's not as many quote unquote, free 10 D plays, like you've got 151, but it's not like back during COVID where every new booster box, you were able to make a decent amount of margin on. So being able to make sure that you're respectful of the fact that, Hey, if I'm wanting to order a certain amount, they're giving it to me. I mean, you, you're going to have to kind of decide up for yourself on how you want that relationship to go moving forward with you and your distributor. Cause you, you, you and you know, worst case scenarios, they drop you. So, I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't want to go that route if it's something where you made a huge commitment and you just really upset them. But yeah, that's just kind of how I look at it, at least from my perspective of having worked with distributors for the past almost four years now. Yeah. And I mean, I, you tell me how you feel about this, but you know, if you're going to be in the sealed, if you're trying to be in the sealed business, I really like, like Pokey any Brian's like model of 
just trying to build up your own site, um, you know, do your own marketing, like maybe pay for marketing, maybe you do it yourself and just draw customers to your site and, and, and build it off of, you know, you're going to ship it well protected. You're going to ship it quickly. People know they're getting a um, legitimate product. You, you build a community that trusts you, things like that, where you can actually sell at or maybe a little over, maybe un under whatever market and make more money than just going through the big platforms like eBay and TCG player, because it's just really hard to compete against the big guys who are probably getting boxes much cheaper than you. They're able to move more product. They're able to take lower margins. And so the, the best play may just try to be to build up your, your own independent website and, and go off like, you know, your trustworthiness, you know, good packaged, you know, shipping, you know, easy to contact, easy to talk with, you know, whatever that type of thing. Um, well, another thing you also have to ask yourself too, um, and, and I don't know who your distributor is, but that also changes it. Right. Cause I have certain distributors that will, that, uh, that will give me pre-allocated products. So I didn't even ask for it. They just gave me the pre-allocated product and it's non-negotiable in price. I'm not interested in picking up those items because for me, I want the negotiated pricing. If I have other distros that are selling me booster boxes for 80, 90 bucks, hit 88 90 <laughs> i wish 80 um then for me it's one of these things where oh if you're going to sell it for 95 50 you're not willing to negotiate price then i don't care about your allocations sure it might slightly hurt me when it's the you know go around of the specialty sets but ultimately at the end of the day i would much rather garner relationships with um distributors that are going to allow me to negotiate prices so if there is another distributor that does pre-allocate and they will you know, negotiate the prices, then obviously I want to make sure I'm picking that product up so that I can garner that relationship that's going to allow me to get cheaper prices. And then obviously other distributors won't even pre-allocate. They'll just ask, how much do you want? And then you'll get what you get. And at that point, then it's like, all right, well, you definitely asked for this product. This is kind of what we gave you. Why are you dropping it now? That's obviously something that's kind of on you. So Bozzy's room, that's your answer, man. You, you got your money's worth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, another uh, um, Alfred mentioned. So Danny Phantom and Pokey Annie have videos of dead product they had to pick up from distros like Battle Academies when Elo and ST reprinted. You know a thing or two about those. <laughs> My throne? My throne of Battle Academies, baby. I know all about that. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. I am very familiar with that kind of dead product. So, yeah, it's... um. I mean, but other than the battle academies, which I don't even see that as like picking up dead product, I almost look at it as free because I baked it into the cake as like the price, right? I'm not like, oh man, I'm losing 10 bucks. It's like, no, I'm paying the price of whatever the bundle was for the LO and ST, and that's kind of it, you know? Yeah. So um outside of those items, I don't really have a ton of dead product that I can really say that I'm sitting on. The one thing that was really nice about um at least the way in which we built up and foster the relation we have with our distributors is we started off buying a bunch of like garbage product as a program. And when I say garbage product, it wasn't honestly that bad. Like in hindsight, we're buying these uh, collector's chests and, you know, build in battles and build in battle stadiums. And we were able to find value from them through just the packs within it. But it wasn't like we were going in here and just, getting the most high desirable items it wasn't like we were just getting evolving skies and brilliant and other booster boxes like no we were having to buy these crappier items break them down to get a pack price value and build up our you know relationship that we have with other distributors and after we kind of played that grind and did that and built up that spend our allocation numbers just continued to grow and then it just kind of became a snowball effect where now it's no longer a conversation of like oh man can we get enough product I hope we get enough allocated. It's like, no, we now can get as much as we want. I mean, I won't say the number because I don't want to like <laughs> say I don't want to break my relationship with my distributor, but there was a specific number that they gave me and they said, hey, if you wanted this amount of booster boxes, we would give it to you. And it's far from where we are currently ordering. So we're at a point where if we wanted more boosters up until a certain point, I mean, we could literally 
just keep ordering, ordering, ordering um, from this specific distributor. And they would just keep giving us the product because of the amount of spend and the relationship that we've built with them. So that's kind of where I look at it in that regard of like, hey, this is what we did in, in terms of fostering that relationship where we took a lot of their crappy stuff because they were trying to get rid of it. And we were able to, you know, negotiate it with the program. All right, dude. So you're doing this all wrong. Let me let me teach you something, okay? Oh, my bad, my bad. Guys, battle academies. This could be the next big thing. All right. There's not a lot of them left out there. I don't see a lot of them on the market. I still have some left, and I'm willing to give them to you at a good price if you want to join the program and purchase. You know what? What's the price? What are we gonna sell them for, man? I got so many battle academies. I got you guys. We're, we're next big pickup. We got we gotta be pumping numbers, dude. That's 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 what we're here for. That's the plays, baby. That's the plays. But FOMO goes ST build and battle stadiums, Eli. Oh man, those were so fantastic when we had those. For those of you guys that don't know, um so there was this incredible play where build and battle stadiums for Silver Tempest. So they were selling on one of our distributors for 30 bucks. And our other distributor was able to price match it. And that was one of the big things we um, built spend off of, which $30 isn't really that crazy. I mean, like, I think 36 is like the main wholesale price. So 20% discount. I mean, that that in my mind feels kind of big. But the big thing that was fantastic about it was this was right when Scarlet and Violet was first coming out and they introduced the Gardevoir EX. The Curlia cards were selling for $6 a pop as one of the promos for the build and battle stadiums. So, and then the Archaeopses were selling for like three or four bucks. So the build and battle stadium plays were so good for silver tempest because this was back when there was no announcement of reprints for silver tempest and silver tempest boosters were going for like 160. So silver tempest packs were selling for a decent amount. And you also had promo cards that were selling for as low as like, you know, a dollar or two, but as high as six bucks. And, you were getting that as part of your bulk. So the stadiums were like one of those plays where we we just were able to take so much value out of it and it was seen as a bad product. So we took advantage. Like that's kind of the stuff you want to be able to do as you're building up spend within your uh, distribution line just so that you can be able to get to the point where you don't have to make plays like that. And if plays like that do happen where you can now take advantage of that as an opportunity outside of just like, Hey, is this helping me build spend? It's like, no, this is an opportunity where I'm going to get the allocations I'm going to get regardless. This is just a chance for me to be able to also get, you know, extra attendees in this situation. Right. It's no longer a debate of like, I need to pick this up because I need to build spend. It's now, of, Hey, I've already built the spend. I can take advantage of this if I want or it's not worth my time. Let me go do other plays, you know, putting yourself in that position where you don't have to feel liquidity locked because you're constantly building spend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, good to me, but here's my question to you though. Average player loves to just absolutely troll the crap out of me. Um, Eli ending my current employment. So we'll have some extra time on hand. If you still need what we talked about. Oh, a thousand percent average player. So just to kind of, um, well, I, I mean, I, I, I don't see anything of not mentioning this. So, uh, for those of you guys that don't know with the wholesale program right now, um, we're getting to a point of where we want to transition that over and a lot of other things over to a built out website. And, um, with that being said, I am going to also start doing regular blog posts. And so average player, uh, once the website is built, he's going to be one of our guys that's going to help write blogs for us. So I'm actually really excited about that because if you haven't seen the new website redesign, it's it looks really clean. We're just trying to get all the back end stuff implemented in place. So now can you, um, can you comment on the blog posts? uh in what regard well because i want to have a chance to like come troll him now like oh, oh of course <laughs> of course of course yeah <laughs> average player just gonna make a bunch of troll blog posts no um no i mean so the the blog posts are gonna be pretty simplistic so once we have i mean because 
where I am right now is I'm obviously doing these lives every Tuesday with you, right? And we're going to continue to do these lives, but it's more or less for, for me a way to also be like, Hey, here's an update of what's going on. But once we go live with the store, live with the website, live with blog posts, live with me posting videos again regularly, everything's going to kind of come together and yeah, more yeah, or less. Okay, come on. <laughs> what? You posting videos regularly. Hey, it's going to happen again, bro. I did it for like two years straight. So I'll <laughs> just the storefront got in the way. So I um. So once we get back to doing that regularly, then blog posts are kind of kind of be a part of that, right? We're going to have blog posts where we're going to discuss it um, more or less kind of detailing the video topic, but doing a more in-depth breakdown, discussing what items we like to pick up or what's going to be um, some news going on within Pokemon, kind of like what Poke Beach does, but more on like an analytical side of the, from the investor perspective, right? Because I think that's something that's important because a lot of times people will kind of spend, you know, watching like a 10, 15, 20 minute video versus if we have article formats of it, you can kind of just go through quickly read and get to the point without having to waste a lot of time skipping to get to the, you know, main sections of it. Um, yeah, another thing is the videos guys. Yeah. Come on. Come on. We see the engagement now. Um, and, and another thing is too, I think, which I'm most excited about is within the wholesale program. I feel like there's a lot of people that are, really good at taking advantage of the opportunities, but a lot of people don't have time to constantly spend, you know, their time doing research, looking at like what the best plays are. So we want to also create a weekly post that will basically tell people within the program what our favorite picks are and items that, hey, right now we think this is a really good pickup because of XYZ reason. I think it's an opportunity we're talking about. I think that was something that- idea. I mean, well, that was the first conversation I had with one of our biggest spenders when they came out with the more Peco V, um, the, the 50% off sale on one of our main distributors where you were getting crown Zenith packs for like stupid cheap, but everyone was kind of sleeping at the wheel other than like a handful of people. And I had one of the guys message me and he was like, I don't know what people are doing, but the free tendies that are on this crown Zenith more Peco item for the treasure collection is insane. Like, I don't understand why more people aren't hopping on it. And I made an announcement and all of a sudden everyone was on it. And so for me, I'm like, I feel like there's a lot of people that are missing out on opportunities because they're not taking a second to do like a little bit of the research. So if I can help people by doing that for them, then I think it's going to add a ton of value, not only to the program, but also just an opportunity for us to really be able to get more value within the program, right? So but the real the real question is right. Time to go all in <laughs> now or never. What does that mean? What does that mean? I don't know. We only spent twenty minutes trying to come up with a title for today's topic. What does it really mean? <laughs> that's the title you put on there, man. I'm just asking you. Part know. of the part of the blog posting, man. That's what it's that's what it's all about. It's now or never. We're getting an Astro. We're getting one one fifty one. We're getting in Lost Origin. Now or never. Yeah, well, baby. I could actually tell a story. Like here, I have, I have a legitimate story. I just had a conversation this week with a, a friend of mine who's he's invested in on and off of Pokemon during you know these last nine years with me, right? And legitimate, this is exactly what he said. He goes, I'm, this is not a joke. He said, I'm considering taking a home equity line out on my house for about 50 to 100 grand and throwing it all in Pokemon. He said, he said, how many years have we been in this and how many times have we watched boxes, no matter what's going on, the economy's bad or things are going to crash or this, the boom, there's Logan Paul, there's free money from the government. He goes, how many times have we seen things double, triple, quadruple in such a short amount of time and not went all in? And I go, uh, I'm like, yeah, man, I know. He's like, I think I'm just going to do it this time. I think I'm just going to get all the money I possibly can. I'm just going to throw it all in this new era and I'm going to see what happens in the next two, three to four years. <laughs> That's wild, bro. That's serious. And I'm just <laughs> like, I mean, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you it's super risky. I don't know if I do that, but at the same time, I can't say you're going to be wrong. I don't know. Did you ever watch that a documentary? I don't know if it was a documentary, but interview they did where there was like, um, it was a husband and a wife. And you remember how many kids they had, but they sold their home and put it all in Bitcoin. And they were like a firm believer that Bitcoin was going to the moon. And I think they bought it at like three grand or something. Hey, Dogecoin, Dogecoin millionaire. 
Oh man. Like obviously uh, they take a huge risk and they could have lost everything, but it paid off. That's, this isn't a conversation of like, Oh, that means it's going to work. You should do it. But it is, I guess, an attestment to, Hey, sometimes these risks pay off, but I feel like that's so sketch. That's so sketch. Do Doing that for Pokemon. I mean, what is he, is he paying interest on that? I mean, obviously it'd be a, it'd be a home equity line. Oh my God. That's yeah. brutal. And I I'm can't like, do it because dude. of that. I wouldn't be the, the, I mean the accrual on interest. That's just so scary. Like that's so scary for me. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I mean, you know, I just, I'm just saying it's like, so it's just a good story. And like now your average player player said he wasn't kidding that a friend of his literally took out a loan for 50 K to buy Pokemon and made 20 K after paying back the bank. Like, dude, honestly, I, me and the same friend had the same conversation back in like 2017. There were like, there was a listing for, I think like 20 fossil first edition boxes at $1,500 a piece. And I'm like, dude, let's just, let's line some credit cards. Let's just buy every single one of them. We'll try to work a deal, get them for like 13, 12, 1300 or whatever. And I mean, like start, we had this idea back then, never did it. And it's like, every time you don't go in, it ends up happening. I'm like, Hey, maybe this will be the one time it doesn't, or maybe it'll be a good play. I don't know. But I'm like, I go, I told him, I'm like, I'd be a lot more, like you said, I said, I'd be a lot more behind you if this was like cash or something and you weren't paying interest on it. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like I discussed it, you know, and obviously not financial advice. All these things are risky. So don't just immediately jump at it and act as if there isn't any risk attributed to it. Right. Cause at the end of the day, you could lose everything, like literally everything you put yourself in so much debt up to your eyes that you would be just, I mean, it would set you back so far in life. So let's, let's be conscious of that here. Um, Hey, hey Eli, sorry, man. I, I know you don't like drama on your channel. Oh, oh, I always got this dude trolling me in every live I go into. So godly shad, man, I thought Astral Radiance was going to be 200 and then by this week. Hey, man, it's not 200, but I just got one thing. How's your, how are your vintage slabs doing? How are, how are your vintage slabs doing compared to all these modern slabs? I just got to ask. I don't know what's going on. So I'll just keep letting you ask he's, the he's question. like an all that... vintage guy always trolls me and other people. About oh, that. I see. And it's like, it's just, it's, it's fun. It's fun. Uh, um, but what I was going to say was like, I've been very vocal about like my usage of 0% APY credit cards for 12 months. Like I literally, I think I talked about this most recently. I got a credit card that's got 0% APY over 12 months. It's $20,000 line of credit for the business. And I'm literally just taking that money and just dumping it into product and then going to pay it off over a 12 month period. Like just simple as that. So, but Wait, for me, oh yeah, but I'm doing it for, uh, I'm doing it for magic product though, because I can easily just churn the product. Cause like you're right now, pay the interest and make a profit you're saying. Well, there's no interest. It's 0% APY for 12 months. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. So literally 12 month credit card of 0% APY, um, $20,000 line of credit just literally went in. I put 19,000 on it and just bought a bunch of magic product to just flip. I bought just basically all the commander decks that I thought were worth it, as well as like Baldur's Gate draft. Cause the money on that is insane right now. There's just been so many good magic plays recently. It's been so insane. And since I obviously have the machines to make the flips, it's been fantastic to be able to utilize it. So, cause, cause we took obviously um, a decent amount of our like, how do I want to say this? Like we, we spent 32 grand on the storefront opening. Right. And so I didn't want to like liquidity lock myself with the storefront and not have inventory to burn and churn. Cause I feel like I'm losing money if the Roka is not constantly running. And so I'm like, all right, I got to make sure that a lot of this capital is going back into the Roka operation so I can make money on it and just slowly pay it off. So that's kind of where I am. I mean, that's literally what I did to get the Roka to begin with. I went and opened up a credit card, $20,000 limit, put 5,000 down in cash, paid the rest off with the credit line and just made the payments over time. And voila, I got myself a card sorting machine. So it's, you know, Dude, I, 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 I mean, you know, how I am with bulk. <laughs> the best way it's like the whole, like, what is the old saying? Like the best way to eat an elephant one bite at a time. It's just like, same thing with business. It's like, you can't look at all the stuff you're accruing or how much you're going to owe at the end or how big the bill is. Like it's just one day at a time, one month at a time, like how much 
can I turn and burn this month to make the bills and make a little profit and just keep going down the road and building over time? Like, I, I just think the, the big scary numbers scare people in the beginning or that are like taking out that loan or getting the big Roca. It, it can scare people. But when you like break it down, like you do, it just, you can make it make sense. Well, it's one of those things too, for myself as well, where it's an asset. It's not like I'm just, you know, willy nilly getting a credit card, which is a liability. Like this is an item that's going to immediately generate a higher output of revenue for the business. So for me, I would literally be making more money by taking out the credit card rather than doing a, a traditional business loan, which is going to cost me like seven to eight percent. Instead, I know, hey, this is twenty thousand dollars plus the five thousand I paid in cash. Why not just take that twenty thousand, spread it out as if I'm making payments on the machine over a twelve month period, and I can easily cover that because the machine is going to be generating the difference in the output efficiency that I'm going to have by utilizing it. So it just felt like it was paying for itself. Not to mention too, like uh, with the just rate of inflation and especially with what's been going on with the fed and everything that's being discussed, money now is more valuable than money in the future. So any way I can make money with other people's money in the current, you know, market, I always see it as a massive win. So Cause that's something I always consider. Yeah. I mean, I don't take like any crazy risks, but I, I, I definitely use 0% interest credit cards before. Um, but I've always had like the cash to back it up. Right. Like, so like I'll have like my brokerage account, it's not a retirement IRA, anything like that. I just have money in a TD Ameritrade brokerage account that I yeah uh, trade swing trade with. And so it's like, yeah. you know, I don't, I'd always only load the credit card up like to where I knew that, Hey, I, I have the cash if I need to, but odds are I'm just going to like pay it off slowly and, and get it paid off before I pay any interest. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Like we talked about it last thing. It's like credit can be useful. Use it responsibly. Yeah. Understand what you're doing. Don't pay interest to credit card companies. Like, um, like you said, it's like, it's more valuable to be able to use the cash now to grow. Um, as long as you, you know what you're doing and you're not getting yourself into trouble where you're like, okay, I need to, I'm, I'm, I'm praying that I have this money in six months. If not, I don't know what's going to happen. It's like, no, you know, it's going to be there. You know. Yeah. It's always just making sure you never over leverage yourself and understanding risk management. If something goes South, what is your plan B, C, D, and E? Like, that's just how I've always looked at it. Right? Like it's one of these things where, all right, what is my risk tolerance? What do I have currently to cover that in case something were to hypothetically go belly up to where I don't put myself in a ton of debt? Cause ultimately the one thing that I really hate the most is debt. I'm not a fan of debt, but ultimately I also understand that there is a way to grow my business more exponentially by having tools, assets, you know, such as machines to generate more revenue for the business. And so any way that I can try and safely and as low risk as possible make the adjustments based off of what my current revenue is and how I'm going to be able to cover that. Cause like I said, man, if I'm splitting that over a 12 month period, I would literally have to lose 70% of the business's revenue in order to afford that. So it's not one of these things where it's like, Oh man, I'm like paycheck to paycheck on the credit card. It's like, no, the, the economy would have to tank so bad. And even then I would just need to sell product to be able to cover it. Not ideal, but like I play these scenarios all the time in my head of like, Hey, if I were to lose X amount of money, would I still be able to cover any sort of, you know, quote unquote debt that I use to grow the business? Cause outside of that, like I've been someone that's never missed any payments on my credit card, always pay a statement balance off in full, never paid a dime of interest on anything. So, I mean, heck, even when it comes to vehicle loans, I'm constantly trying to find ways to refinance my vehicles to get a cheaper rate if I can. So it's, it's something where I just, uh, I am just someone that is not a fan of debt to begin with. And so anyway, I can try and avoid it as much as possible or utilize it in a way to where it, it's not just losing me money, but I can actually generate more money then that's, that's kind of where I can, you know, justify it to a certain extent. I'm going to say me back to way. I mean, I, I stay debt free. Like, you know, a lot of people are like all against like paying your house off. Like that's what a lot of my extra income goes towards every month is paying our house off. Like that's kind of our, our short-term goal. It, it's because 
you know, what debt is to me, it's risk. Like when you were eliminate all risk from your life, it's just, everything's a lot more enjoyable. You're not stressed out. You don't, you're not worried about the constant ebbs and flows of, of, of life or, or the markets. And it's, you know, but everyone's got different, you know, goals, different things they're trying for. Well, so like, I guess like a personal anecdote to that is I, so my car was having trouble. Um, and so I needed a new vehicle cause it was just going to cost me basically more to get it fixed than it was the actual value of the vehicle went, sold the car. And I did a bunch of research and said, Hey, the next vehicle that I'm going to get, I want to make sure that it's one that's going to last me a while. It's going to have very minimal car trouble and it's going to, you know, lose it's, it's not going to devalue itself aggressively year over year. And who would have guessed it? I chose Toyota, right? So I went in, I got myself a Toyota Corolla hybrid because the fuel efficiency was fantastic for the price that I was paying for the car. And with that, I, at the time, cause the rates for, um, cars were expensive. It was an 8.4% interest rate, right? Then six months later, after I got the loan, I went saw that interest rates have gone down, refinanced down to 6.1%. They have a three month gap period where you don't have to pay on the actual um, loan until it switches over to the new institution that you refinance with. I just said, hey, rather than just take those three months and not pay towards the vehicle, because it's obviously not, you know, I'm not having to pay for the loan. I just said, I'm just going to keep putting up auto payments as if I'm just continuing to pay for my, you know, monthly um, monthly expense and I'm paying towards the principal for three months. So I look at it as like three months of not having to pay interest, but just paying towards the principal, which then pays it off faster. So I'm just like anything I can do to get myself out of debt faster with lower, um, you know, interest rate and paying towards the principal. That's kind of what I'm looking for. But however, there, there is one thing I will say that is also important to consider though, there does become a time and I've learned this, which is crazy to say where I literally have as much as I hate to say it, lost more money by paying things off faster because it, I could have then it's like, it's like if I said to myself, Hey, I want to pay double of what I'm currently paying for my, you know, 60 month on my car. And instead of paying the 480, which is what I'm paying monthly right now, let's say I paid a thousand. I'm actually losing money to a certain extent by paying it off sooner because the amount of money I could make off of that revenue that would have instead gone back into the business would actually outpace the rate of um, interest that I'm paying on the vehicle that I'm quote unquote, like paying off faster towards the principal. So it's one of these weird situations where you're like, man, I want to pay it off faster because I hate being in debt, but ultimately I'm actually losing money because I would be making more money by taking it and just letting it pay the, you know, the minimum over the 60 months because I can then take that money and make more money than what I would be having to pay in interest. So it's, it's, it's a weird situation where I've had to kind of play that game of really calculating it out down to the um degree. So, I mean, it, it's, it's always the issue, right? Like you can, you can play that game forever. It's just like, there's no way to quantify risk. That's the issue. Like there's no way to quantify by risk and quantify the, the stress that it puts on your life, the quality of your life, like taking this many risks, being in a, a large amount of debt. So it's like, you know, you could always, and, that, and that's what a lot of people, like someone mentioned Dave Ramsey, that's what a lot of people do when they like uh, refute Dave Ramsey's stuff. And it's just, it's all based on what you want out of your lifestyle, how fast you want to get to to where you're trying to go and how much risk you're willing to, um, you know, take on to do that. And so like some people are a lot more comfortable, okay with risk, like they don't lose an ounce of sleep. They're never stressed about it. And, you know, when it pays off, they're ahead. And then other people, you know, they like to take it a little slower, be more conservative, not live with any stress. Like, and you know, like you said, you're going to end up a little farther, further behind than if you would have taken those risks. It's, I don't think there's a right answer, right? I mean, financially, you could say there was a right answer after the fact, but it's really hard to know in the heat of the moment, like what the right answer is sometimes. Well, I just do the math of what's in front of me. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's my right answer. My right answer is, Hey, do I, lose more in interest by paying off the vehicle later or do i make more money by that which outpaces the rate of interest by well, the point that is money like there's there's it. unknowns right like there's the 08 you know financial crash and, and real estate crash like a lot of people that were leveraged they got crushed they went bankrupt like 
there's, you know, COVID stuff that changed, you know, lives of, of businesses and people forever that, you know, people that were leveraged in certain industries got crushed on that because, you know, certain things changed. Like, you know, this market, it's like the more leverage you have, the more, the, the more risk you're definitely taking on, even if the numbers make sense now. And even if you put it through a stress test, there are always things in life like world war could break out and things could really, it's like, there are always things that could crush you. Is my oh, opinion. of course. And that's why I, I, I guess going back to the, the example I was giving where it makes more sense for me to not pay towards the principal because of where my business is right now. That is obviously always going to be caveated by if something like that were to happen. But ultimately at the end of the day, if that does happen, then I will shift my position in how I approach paying off the vehicle or any other debts, right? Because right now I just look at it and I say to myself, hey, this is what's making the most financial sense. I have a plan if something changes for, you know, plan B, C, D. It's just, it, it's just not trying to think too far ahead, but also being prepared, you know? It's like, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. I'm always going to be playing what's in front of me and not trying to look, too far into it because ultimately at the end of the day there's a lot of instances where you've heard people say you know 2020 the housing market's going to crash 2021 housing market's going to crash 2022 housing market's going to crash and here we are right so it's like hey if a housing market does crash i'll be ready but i'm not prepping as or acting as if it's going to happen anytime because then that's going to get you burnt because ultimately you're just going to constantly try and like it's like the inverse of catching a falling knife right you're just trying to time the top and it's going to get you murdered a lot of times because you might miss out. But obviously making sure that you're not FOMOing in, but making the best financial decision based off of what's being presented to you in the future or being Absolutely. the present. Sorry. But I love it. But Good yeah, Congo today. Financial advice, guys. Financial advice. Everyone's Let's hear for financial advice on Eli's channel. Oh, gosh. But everyone's talking about cars now. <laughs> I love it, man. It's my first ever Toyota I owned. I owned a I owned a Jetta before, a uh, Volkswagen, because it got it was a diesel and it got fifty miles to the gallon. It was incredible the fuel efficiency on the vehicle. Problem being, it had a lot of issues though. And every freaking time I wanted to go in and get it fixed, they were like, "Yeah, it's a German vehicle, so it's going to cost more because we have to import it." Which, to be fair, like obviously Toyotas are you know, Japanese vehicles, but I mean the, the, like I did a bunch of research. I mean, everyone probably knows Toyota. It's <laughs> Toyota's, uh, it, it's known for its longevity. Now, so I'm it's looking forward reputation. to like when we do get our house paid off and stuff to get into nice cars. Cause we, me and my wife are both driving old Hondas right now. Like we have a 2012 and a 2014 Honda been driving them for, you know, 10 plus 10, 12 years. You there know, you go, baby. Thousand plus miles. And like, I'm just like, Hey, we just got to hold off for like three, four more years and we'll, we'll, we'll get some nice stuff. Like, Yeah, lucky you. How much did you pay on your mortgage? How much was the upfront cost of the home? 225 Oh my God, that's crazy. When was and this? We just, had, we just had a house sell around the corner for 355 When was this that you bought the home? Uh, 19 What a time. Yeah. It's that's crazy. crazy. It's crazy. That's so crazy, dude. Wait, yeah. how 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 old were you in nineteen? Um, twenty nine. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> jealous. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, Missouri is obviously cheaper than Arizona. Oh, a hundred percent. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, like like most homes in the area are like five to six hundred thousand. So yeah, that's that's crazy. That's crazy yeah, for me. Wow. That's cool. That's, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. And it's one of those worst things where you're like, it actually makes more sense for you to get a bigger place because the, the like market itself is so, like you can get a home for 500,000, 500, you know, 50,000. That is right around 2000 to like 1500 square feet or you could go spend an extra 50,000 and get a home for 600,000. That's going to be 3000 square feet. Yeah. Like it's crazy. it's, it's crazy. The jump in price. And so it's one of those things where I always ask myself, like, I don't need this big of a home now, but for 50,000 more, I get a thousand more square feet. 
I don't, it's always weird because you're always playing. And it's not even one of these things where it's like, oh, you're paying for the location. That's why certain ones are more than others. Like, nope, you'll have homes that are literally a block from each other. Same model, same condition, same everything. You're like, this makes no sense. But I guess it's just because three twos are always the most desirable that everyone wants. So whenever you see a four, two and a half, people are like, or a five, two, you're like, oh, no one cares. Or a five, three which is weird to me, but maybe, maybe as someone who wants kids in the future, I see that in a different limelight. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge deal. If you're having kids or not. Um, last year bought my house for two fifty. Zillow value bumped it up to 300,000. Yikes. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Everyone out here. I'm too young, man. I was, let's see, 2019. I was turning 21 in 2019. So yeah so i bought i bought my first house uh in 15 so i was 25 i was still in college dude <laughs> i was still i was still in college working as a server <laughs> now if you want to talk about risk tolerance right here's how crazy at risky i am so me and my wife or my, my fiance at the time she's my wife now we she was just a pharmacy tech making 15 dollars an hour we, we built a, uh, at the time it was like a $290,000 house brand, like built it brand new. Um, and I was running my lawn care company. The next year I decide, Hey, I'm going to try to make an online business. And I quit my job and went for it. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> it was crazy. Worked out. Well, it didn't. I, I, you know, I ended up having to, to start in our business and, and Oh, oh and, I didn't know this was the one that worked out. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't work out. It didn't work out. Man, I didn't even know what I wanted to do in 2019. I was literally just like going to school for finance and was like, all right. So actually, I, I kind of knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to go pro in volleyball. And then I was just going to school for finance just to have a degree. And I wasn't in any debt, thankfully. But that's huge. Um, You know, I don't have any student loans, never had any of that. So I was just working, coaching playing and going to school and then i was like 2020 i'm gonna go you know bumming out in california with some family members and then COVID happened so there went that and hence started you know pokemon as the business model because all right can't do volleyball because everything's closed now what so that's kind of what transitioned and changed things but i'm 25 now so i mean i can't be too upset i'm obviously you know, hoping to be in a position where we'll get a, a home sooner than later, but it's definitely difficult. What do you need a home for? You got a card shop. Yeah, yeah, right. My wife and I always joke about that. Like, well, it's just, you know, <laughs> when you annoy me at night, you can go sleep at the card shop. I'm like, thanks, babe. <laughs> yeah, man. But, um, are so overrated. We're... card shops are underrated in 2024, right? Dude, I, you know, <laughs> We'll see. We'll see, man. We'll see. But I'm excited. It's going to be a fun journey. We'll kind of see where it is. Um, I have I, I have a couple of uh, questions we'll take, and then we should probably wrap it up here. We're an hour and 20. But uh, Pokemart TCG said, Eli, I have a friend that has a shop, but no Roka machine. He rigged Binder Pro to TCG player to scan a list, a ton of card shop in minutes. Currently, he's doing bulk magic runs and making money quick. Yeah, well, so... The thing is about Binder Pro, there's been, I have a lot of shops that I'm friend with that use it and I've heard nothing but negativity around it. There's just too much like, there. you just don't have a lot of flexibility with Binder Pro is the problem. Um, and I think you have to run on Shopify's net or uh, yeah, Shopify's network if I'm correct. I'm not 100% certain, but there's just been a lot of people that have just complained more or less that I've discussed it with binder pro and it's like, Oh, I have to use binder pro and I don't want to be one of those card shops that gets kind of sucked into that. Um, I, I, I understand it works for some people in their business, but I feel like a large portion of those people that it works for, usually they form their business model around binder pro because there's less flexibility in like pricing things out. But yeah, no, it's, it's tough. I don't, I don't anticipate using card binder. Um, right now we're looking at, um, we're currently using, uh, what's it called? Clover. That's kind of what we're looking for a system. And then obviously we use Miva for a website. So we're just going to have to build an integration for that. But I, I, I foresee myself using WooCommerce past Miva, honestly, we just needed to get something set up for the website, which has taken longer than we would have liked because Miva's awful. 
So it's uh, it's a fun time, but tis tis running a business. Um, let's see if there's a couple other questions we can answer uh, before we kind of go into it. Most people talk about the cars. Most people talk about cars. Dave Ramsey, uh, liquidity. Um, oh, I guess this is another question for me. Um, okay, so startup cost. What's monthly fixed overhead rent and then projected variable head cost? Um, monthly fixed. So rents four thousand. Um, utilities is going to. I mean, if you consider electric in this, it's going to range anywhere between about seven hundred dollars to uh, around thirteen hundred dollars. Obviously, that goes up during the summer times because of heat. Um, so add on another, you know, high end of, what would that be? 5,300 to as low as 4,700. Um, and then outside of that, you have, um, just the cost of employees. That's kind of the big one, honestly, like the cost of employees is the biggest, you know, variable is, you know, how much people are going to get paid. How much are we going to hire people in terms of their hours? Like, my projected conservative estimate is it's going to be about 9,000 is kind of where we are. I mean, that's being really conservative though, because I think that realistically it's probably going to be closer to 8,000, but I want to give myself a $1,000 buffer um, on kind of like the cap expense that we anticipate to have as like a monthly cost. So, but that's, but that's all in all, right? Cause employees, I mean, hiring two employees is going to cost me like you know, three, four grand, like it's not cheap. So, um, but that's the way it is with the business, baby. Um, let me see if I can get more money, more problems, bro. More money, more problems, man. Um, <laughs> Eli is your wife an employee. She is the employee. She is our head operational manager for the storefront. Is she she's the, the COO? COO. She's the COO, baby. Yeah, my wife's the COO of the company. She's the chief. She's the chief, baby. Chief operating <laughs> officer. So she uh she basically runs the entire Roca operation and then she runs any of the shipping operations uh for Arizona. We have um someone right now working for the Oregon shop which also I saw someone ask the question about the business. Is this correlated to, or is this like um, tied to the Oregon shop? This is the storefronts completely different from the Oregon shop. The Oregon shop I'm a part owner of the shop in Arizona is going to be its own thing, which I own a hundred percent of. And I had no outside investors. Um, that's kind of why I wanted to do the Arizona shop. And with that, um, we have employees that work at the Oregon shop right now, but once we completely get everything you know, transferred over to the Arizona shop. My wife's going to take over the full duties of running the shipments on a weekly basis. So we desperately need employees. <laughs> we desperately are going to need employees because having her run like the bulk operation and the shipping operation, and then also needing to have someone who I can train to run the front of house. Like there's, there's so much that goes into it. It's crazy. Um, and then for people player makes a amazing point that isn't talked about enough. <laughs> Um, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second real quick. Um, the opening day, we don't have an official grand opening yet. Um, just cause I want to coordinate that with the chamber of commerce in Ahwatukee cause it's going to be in Phoenix. So, but we want to do a grand opening and like a ribbon cutting thing. So, but we're hoping to do sometime in May is kind of the goal. So our signage is supposed to happen mid May. So sometime near like when we get signage or near the end of May would kind of be the best uh, at worst. I'm thinking June 1st, but so we're about a, I want to say about a month, a month and a half out, but, um, uh, average player says people often say they want their, uh, to be their own boss, but really don't know what it entails. Being a nine to five employee relieves you of so much stress. A thousand percent, a thousand percent. Um, yeah, I, I just, I think like, uh, hmm especially with like channels like ours or, you know, it can like glorify running a business. Whereas like, look, there's definitely a lot of work behind the scenes. Anyone who's portraying it like it's easy or like it's uh, like free tendies, free money. Oh, I don't even work. And I make all this money or, you know, it, it guys, it, it definitely takes a lot of work. Like, I mean, I would look, there's definitely people. I mean, Eli does really well. There's, there's people in this industry that do really well. But a lot of the people that are like have the loudest voices and brag the most and, and show every play they make and all this, 
a lot of them are probably making as much, sometimes less than what a lot of people are making, just going to a regular nine to five and doing Pokemon on the side. So just, just keep that in mind. Well, when I first started, like when I moved to Arizona and I first started going full time, I was working about 14 on, on average, 14 to 16 hours a day. Like I remember my longest day was I did a 20 hour where I literally worked from 10 to I think it was like four in the morning. And then, and, and the reason why I worked that late was because I had a flight back home to go help with the shop. And so I straight up worked from 10 in the morning until uh, four in the morning the next day. Flight left at five, power napped on the, f on the, the plane after I worked at the airport, got off the plane, kept working, slept some more, and then went to a business meeting and then went to the shop. So like technically speaking, if you like consider the time, like if you don't consider the sleep time, I basically worked for like 30 hours straight, but I consider my sleep time as break, I guess. But that was like at the inception of like the, the business model that we have now in the business. And so, you know, the 14 to 16 hours is uh, more realistic, you know, working days from, you know, 10 to, oh my God. Is it 14 to 16 hours or is it more? How many hours is working 10 to 2? <laughs> that's that's 14 hours, right? No, yeah. that's 16. That's, that's 16. 16. That's 16. Oh shit. Wow. Oh my gosh. Um, I worked more than <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of work. But but the thing was is like I only did that at the early stages because I was trying to like figure out the business. But then as the business really grew and we started to figure out ways to like build it out and make it more efficient the value of like my time started to go up and needing to find ways to free it up was key right because it's like you're in the nitty-gritty of like hey i'm trying to grind try and get the you know infrastructure set up for this business to succeed now that i have the infrastructure uh, set up how do i now start to free up my time because progressively i mean i told i think for those of you guys that don't know I, uh, one of the reasons why I went full steam ahead in the business was because I moved to Arizona for volleyball once again, because after COVID happened, I was like, I still want to do the volleyball dream. I got injured and was out for seven months. And so I needed to fill myself with time. And that was the business. The business was what I filled my time with, but ultimately I gained 55 pounds because I wasn't eating well. I wasn't sleeping well. I was just so, so much like grinding when it came to work that I needed to like get to a point where I was like, all right, I need to start being more healthy. I need a better work life balance, but I will get there once the business is where it is. And so for me, I'm working now closer to like eight hours a day of like, just like consistent work schedule. I mean, I do answer phone calls or like I do respond to emails and text messages outside of like the general eight hour work day. But it's less hectic, I guess, is the point that I'm trying to say, because for me, it's one of those things where it took time. But I think what the most difficult thing is, is like, I'll sit here and say like, yeah, I work eight hours a day, right? Like I'll get up at nine and like I'll work till like five o'clock. But it's one of these things where sure, I'll wake up at nine and like, quote unquote, like stop being on my computer around five o'clock. But if I get an important phone call or I have an email I have to respond to because it's a different time zone or there's something that I need to take care of. I will still have to take care of it. And that's one thing you don't have to do with a general nine to five most of the time. Like you can just go into work, leave at five, not have to stress out about a lot of things. You're never really taking, like you're always on the clock when you own your own business. And that's something that can be really stressful because it's not one of these things where it's like, all right, I want to take some time off because you know, I'm getting married or I have a family member that wants to come visit for the holidays or vice versa. Like I have to find ways to work around that, which can be extremely stressful because now it's no longer one of these things where it's like, yeah, I'll have like a coworker cover for me or I can work remote. Like, no shipments need to get done. And I need to be able to trust someone to run the shop without our supervision vision, hoping that things aren't just going to like, you know, get burned up in flames. So that's another scary thing that you have to kind of think about because you have so much trust that goes into that since you're so much like you you have everything vested in the business, you know? Dude, I mean, I, and this isn't, dude, this is the stuff that's not talked about. Like, you know, and, and a lot of people in, the, in this hobby, like they play it off as like, oh, well, I enjoy the hobby. So I don't mind, you know, 
sitting with my wife watching TV or a movie while I'm on the computer making listings or updating listings or dealing with customers who made questions or, you know, dealing, get, uploading more pictures or someone more like no one talks about that. They just, everyone, and that's the issue with life, right? It's like the, the Instagramization of life is like people take snapshots like the good, right? They'll, they'll get on discords or and they'll, they'll post like their sales or their, you know, their, their, their 90 day eBay sales or they'll post their, uh, their big play they made on a grading flip or whatever. And it like, it portrays this, like this non-reality, right? That like, Oh, everything's sunshine and rainbows. It's like, Oh, this is such free tendies, but they don't talk about like the amount of actual hours they work where it's like, well, how much time did you spend like actually looking for all those cards and sourcing those cards and dealing with suppliers, dealing with vendors, messaging back and forth, making deals for yourself, making deals, people trying to buy from you, packaging the orders, like just everything that goes into it. And I just think it, I wish it was talked about more because I just think it's a, uh, the, the the money's always glorified the work's never talked about yeah oh one thousand percent and then when you do the math and say all right the money is glorified but how many hours when you break it down were you making like how much money were you making an hour when you break it down right like it's one thing if you're like yeah i make eight grand a month but it's like okay well were you making eight grand a month working four hours a week or did you make eight grand a month working 80 hours a week like how much how much are you making an hour you know, like that's something people don't really <laughs> kind of talk about there. So, no, but never. that's, uh, that's just the way it is. And TCG player recognize that and raise shipping prices for that reason. <laughs> By the way, if Mason sees this man, Mason, that was a great video, man. Like literally he said TCG player had to raise their shipping prices to save sellers from themselves because people just can't, they, they just, they have to race to the bottom. They have to sell stuff for dirt cheap. They don't want to make any money. They just want to move product basically and work for free. It's it's such a strange world, man. Yeah, no, it is strange. Strange indeed. But um, so I think we're about an hour and 35 in. Is there any last questions you want to take before we kind of just wrap it up here? No, it was a good chat, man. I think chat had a good time. I had a good time talking. Yeah, no, I think it was a good time. I saw your comment back to average player about you going to some events. That's what I want to eventually do. My my kind of goal for my business is I want to be able to like be extremely involved in the store, but kind of outsource a lot of the work to like have people run the front and back and then realistically like push more of the YouTube channel and do a lot more of like event type stuff. Cause I do want to start traveling to uh, Pokemon events and like having booths, but you know, also still being able to hang out with people and meet people and stuff. I mean, I'll be honest, I, I've been very vocal about this and I always, I get argued with it, but I'm going to, I'm probably going to try one time to vend and have a booth or whatever, but I like going to the events and just being there, like yeah. walking around, not having to be tied to, to working a, a, you know, a booth and not having to, you know, have to set up price, everything, do all the work for all those hours. But you know, a lot of people enjoy it. Um, so I'm a fan of going to events. I'm just, I'm not sure I'm a fan of working the events. <laughs> Well, it's going to be one of those things where I'm going to do both. <laughs> I'm going to do, I'm going to set up um, a booth, but then I'll have someone that can run the booth for me while I can kind of like run off. <laughs> but that's, then that's we'll go the back best of both worlds. That would that, be that's, that's kind of what I would like to do, but we got to get the storefront set up first before we can kind of get to that point. So, cause not, cause uh, I'll be tied down to that for a little bit here, but yeah, I would love to go to an event and do that. Like, as a frequent thing where we just travel all the time. That'd be super sweet. I think we, here, I'm going to end it with this. Okay. With all the stuff we talked about in this, I think it's a perfect ending to it. Guys, find a lifestyle that you enjoy and it, it don't make, surround it with how much money you can absolutely squeeze out of every hour of your day. Just, just find something you enjoy, make it, you know, work enough to make enough that it makes you comfortable and happy and be happy with it. And don't worry about what someone else is doing. <laughs> That's the best thing I can tell you. <sighs> you know, that's the thing is it's like quality of life is the most important thing because that's at the end of the day, the idea of money in and of itself is it's supposed to, in theory, help your quality of life. It's supposed to help try and make it so that you can, you know, gain more value out of your life, but don't spend a ton of your life chasing something that isn't making you happier because life is the only form of currency you can never truly get back like you can trade it but you can't really get it back so don't make, get lost in the sauce don't get lost in the sauce baby <laughs> average player send me your inventory i'll make money yeah i'll have to i'll have to definitely try and see if i can partner up with some people i've had some people message me about wanting to uh, partner with vending so but i'll get there i'll get there 
I just uh, I got other things like on my mind I want to take care of first, such as the store. But um, but I think uh, I think that's a good point to end it for sure. Um, as always, please make sure to leave a like, comment down below, subscribe. Really helps the algorithm push it. You know where to see Alex Nostalgianomics. Links down in the description below for that. And uh, yeah, if you want to join the wholesale program, get access to magic. Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Flesh and Blood, so much more. Japanese Pokemon, um, you know, with 151 going on. Make sure to check the link down in the description below for that. And if you have any questions or want to be a part of the community, you can message me on Discord. Link is also down in the description below for that. But that is all for today's video, everyone. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. Peace.